your attention tonight for just a few minutes and um, we will we will I want to get somewhere fast and then get you on to uh, your dinner or wherever it is you're going I know it's Wednesday night everybody's tired and so we will we'll be brief tonight but I do believe that the Lord has a has a message for us Uh, Luke chapter 19 verse 1 and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho and behold there was a man named Zacchaeus which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus. Got a little bit of a something going on here. I don't know. Sounds kind of off. But, uh, and he sought to see Jesus, who, whew, boy, that's a ring in my ear, who he was and could not for the press because he was of little stature. And he ran before and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. So Zacchaeus knew that Jesus was coming through Jericho, and he positioned himself to where he could see Jesus, but he was too small in stature, so he climbed a tree. And when Jesus was, uh, came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto Zacchaeus, Make haste, or hurry up, and come down, for today... I must abide at your house. Can you say, I must abide at your house? And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And they saw it and they murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. You may be seated. So Zacchaeus came out to see Jesus. Jesus didn't know Zacchaeus. He just walked up and said, hey, Zach, come down and hurry up. Come down because I'm coming to your house today. Make haste and come down for today. I must abide at your house. And then the crowd started saying, well, he's going, he's going to eat with a sinner. He's going to a sinner's house. And you know what? They were right. They were correct. Publicans were sinners. He was, he, was, uh, uh, he was a sinner. He was not, uh, uh, he, he, was not a, uh, he did some good things, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. But he um, said, this man, he's, he's going to eat with him, and he's a sinner. He's going to his house. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. For so much as he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And that would stretch to me and to you. He has come to seek and to save, and that is the, for lack of a better term, that's the motto. That is the slogan that's for this church. Right there is 19 and 10, Luke 19 and 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, and that means me and you and everybody else that you have come in contact with today. He has come to seek and to save that which was lost. All right, now, Jesus said two things. He said, I'm going to abide with you. I want to abide in your house. Okay, now what does abide mean? In this context. Anybody got a clue? What's that? Have dinner with? That uh, Yes. Live. Abide in this context means to live. I, I want to come or to stay. Okay? It, it, a temporary uh, use of this word of abide is that I'm going to come and I'm going to abide for a while. Or there's another connotation of this particular term and it means to live. Okay? Now, so... The word abide. Jesus said salvation has come to your house today. I have come to your house to save you. All right. How many of you have had salvation come to your house? 
I'm so thankful I've had salvation come to my house. All right? Now, and we know the story that Jesus went to his house. He, he dined. He stayed a while with Zacchaeus. And then Zacchaeus becomes a footnote in the Bible. There is no, we don't have the book of Zacchaeus. We don't have the biblical history of Zacchaeus. We don't know what happened with Zacchaeus past then. We know that Jesus came to his house. He said, Zacchaeus, salvation has come to your house. I, have, I want to abide at your house. And so we do not know whether I would really like to know. Maybe someday I will know what happened with Zacchaeus. Was Jesus coming to Zacchaeus' house? Did he abide in his house temporarily? Or did Zacchaeus, whenever his encounter with Jesus, did it change things in his life? Did he, was he no longer a sinner? Was he no longer a publican? Or did things change in his life? We don't know that. We don't know if Jesus came and he abode with him, he, he abided with him temporarily, and then he left. Or did that encounter allow Jesus to abide with Zacchaeus forever? We just don't know. We don't know if, if Zacchaeus became a, a dedicated follower of Christ, that he, if he repented of his sins, and, and after, you know, I don't know, Zacchaeus could have been one in the upper room. We don't know. Or he could have just gone back to his old ways. We don't know. One of these days... I'm going to know that. Whenever I get there, I'm going to say, is Zacchaeus here? Is there a sycamore tree up here in heaven? I know there's a, a tree of life, but is Zacchaeus in it? And so I want to know what happened with Zacchaeus. Now, um, my question to you, whenever Zacchaeus climbed up the tree there was there was no <laughs> there was no backstory it's just Jesus walked up and said hey come down because I'm going to your house make haste hurry up I'm coming to your house Jesus already knew his name and he knew where he lived Jesus already knew these things because he knew some things he was a prophet of all prophets it, you could say he was God manifested in flesh and, and God planted that in his mind that I know this man and I know where he lives. My question is, does he know where you live? Does Jesus abide in your house? Now, how many of you raise your hands again if salvation has visited your house? Come on now. Okay. Every one of you ought to have your hands up. My second question is, does he still abide there? Did Jesus come and leave? Did he come and have dinner with you? Did you have an experience with him? And then he left? Or did it change things at your house? Whenever Jesus came to your house, did it change the way you behaved forever? Did it change the way that you perceived God forever? Or did you just experience him and he left? You know, the, the big difference between Peter, I mean, Peter was as close to Jesus as any of the disciples, probably closer. The really, the, the big difference that I see between Jesus and, or, or between Peter and Judas is because Judas was there. He saw all the miracles. He experienced everything. He had the same experiences as Peter. And they both, one of them denied him, the other one betrayed him. Let's split hairs, okay? Which is which? Or which is, you know, but Peter had a relationship. He didn't just have a group of experiences. He had a relationship with Jesus that changed him. At some point, everything that Jesus taught, everything that Jesus did changed Peter. It wasn't just a, a bunch of great experiences, and when Jesus came to dine with Zacchaeus, what a wonderful experience. This healer, this preacher, 
this magnificent man is coming, the most important man in the world is coming to my house. And the most important man that there that was ever born has come to your house. But the question is, does he still abide there? Psalms chapter 5. And I'm, I'm going to dispel some things that are popular uh, misgivings in Christianity today. Psalms chapter 5 and verse 4 says, For thou art not a God, this is the psalmist David, that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with you. Okay, Evil will not dwell with you. The foolish shall not stand in your sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. You hate workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. And in thy fear, I will worship toward thy holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face, for there is no faithfulness in their mouth, and their inward part is very wicked, is, is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher, they flatter with their tongue. Now it says, Destroy them, destroy thou them, O God, let them fall by their own counsels, cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against you. But let all those that put their trust in you rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let them also that love your name be joyful. What? In you. Let them also that love your name be joyful in you. And I'm going somewhere with that in you. God, let me tell you something. And this is something that everyone needs to understand and don't let anyone tell you differently. That sin is a separator. All right? And you can debate that all day long. You just have a Bible study with me and I'll prove that to you. That if you want to be separated from God, David said right here, he said that you will not dwell with wickedness or iniquity. You will not dwell with it. For those who dwell in iniquity and in their sin, you are separated from them. He just said it. And every time that we choose to live in our sin, we choose to separate ourselves, whether we know it or not, from God. Now, it is a separator from God. So uh, don't let anyone tell you that you can live in your sin. And we're going to prove that here in the New Testament. In just a moment, that you can live in your sin and still be, that Jesus be living in your house. Jesus be abiding in you and you and him. I cannot bear that out in the scripture. That's the reason that Jesus came to die for us. So that we who were separated from God, he, he, he's a separate, Jesus is a separator too. Because whenever he died for us. He gave his blood for us on the cross. It gave us access to God again. If we participate in the new covenant, the way the New New Testament says to participate in the new covenant, then we have an opportunity to be reunited with God. You know, it's kind of like the, uh, and Brother Bledsoe spoke about it some on Sunday. Talking about the uh, 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 the prodigal, the prodigal son. Whenever he went and he spent all of his goods and he found himself in the hog pen, and you know it occurred to him, I can return to my father's house. And then he walked out of there and he said, "Come on, pigs, let's go, let's go to my father's house." Come on, pigs, let's go. He put leashes on all the hogs and went to the falls. It wasn't even lawful for a Jew to even touch hogs, to be around hogs, to be doing anything with pork 
okay? He didn't leash up all the hogs and say, come on, boys, we're going to my father's house. He didn't take all the hogs with him. He left the hogs in the hog pen. And if you're going to be abiding in your father's house, you need to leave the hogs in the hog pen. You need to leave your sins in the past. And whenever the prodigal got to his father's house, they didn't kill a hog to celebrate. They killed the fatted lamb. And they celebrated the coming home of the son that was dead. He, and scripture says, my son was dead. And now he's alive. He has come back home. He was dead to his sins and his trespasses. He was living in the hog pens and he's come home. And he didn't bring the hogs with him. He's come to dwell in the Father's house. He's come to abide in the Father's house. Jesus came and he died as a propitiation, a replacement for us. Because we were all condemned to death through the sin of Adam and through our own sins. We were condemned from the beginning. Jesus came to replace that. The only one who could save a sinner and separate the sin from the sinner was Jesus Christ, the righteous. There was no sinner, Brother Charlie. You were a sinner the same as I was a sinner. You, they could crucify you all day long for my sake, and it would do no good because you weren't any more righteous than I was. You know? They could, they could crucify any one of you for my sake and it wouldn't do me a bit of good. You could cover me with your blood and it wouldn't do me a bit of good because you were no more righteous than me. But Jesus Christ, the righteous, that lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, whenever he stepped into the picture, he could replace that. He, could, he, could take, he was a propitiation. He was our replacement. He was the scapegoat. And so, he was the only one, the righteous, that could die for us. You know, and I get, I get really tired so much of people misquoting scriptures and taking scriptures out of context. And, and I know I, I'm a patient person, but I'm like, oh, come on. Oh, my goodness. This is the most popular one. This is the most popular misquoted taken out of context scripture i think in the whole bible well i'm just an old sinner saved by grace come on you don't i i am too okay i was a sinner but i was saved by grace i was saved by god's mercy but he has called us all to not be sinners anymore yes we do fall yes we do fail yes we all do come short of his glory that's the reason that we have his mercy and his grace because we know that he is willing to forgive us but he does not call us to be sinners saved by grace he has called us out of our sin. heard one amen but I get tired of people I'm just an old sinner don't believe that it's okay to live in sin because grace covers it Paul said God forbid he came to separate you from your sin so that you could be reunited with God reconciled with God joined back into the family Romans chapter 5 please go there with me if you have your Bible I know Romans is in here somewhere Romans chapter 5 verse 1 I'm going to read for a little bit therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith unto his grace, wherein stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience, experience, and experience hope. How many of you just really can't wait for your next tribulation? It said that we joy in tribulation. 
And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. He said, while we were yet without strength, for scarcely a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us he said while you were still a sinner Christ died for you that phrase right there would indicate that he expects that once he died for you once you partake of the new covenant that you come out of sin and you no longer be a sinner He said, while you were yet sinners, while you were still sinners, Christ died for you. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we were, when, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. All right, now I'm going to to go to chapter 6. Actually, I'm going to to read there a little bit more. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, who was that? Adam, Adam, and and death by sin. There was no death before there was sin. And so death passed upon all men, For that all have sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense uh, of one many be dead much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many and not as it was by one that sinned so is the gift for the judgment was by one condemnation but the free gift is it is of many offenses unto justification for by one man's offense death reigned by one much more Uh, They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in, in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came unto all men, condemnation also, or even... Uh, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto the justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. That's all of us. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. That's all of us. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where the sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Can you say with me, grace did much more abound. That as sin reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Going on to chapter 6 there, and I'm almost done reading. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, should we go out and sin a bunch so that grace will abound even more? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Don't you know? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore are we, uh, are we buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness. Can you say newness of life? There should be something that really changes about you. Matter of fact, everything should change about you. I mean, everything down to your shoe size ought to change about you whenever you have partaken of the newness of life. For if, okay, I'm going to stop reading right there. But newness of life. So, chapter 5, it says, While we were yet sinners, 
And then it says, but after you have, after you've been baptized into Jesus Christ, into his death and into his resurrection, you need to take on newness of life. You were a sinner over here. But over here, whenever you have taken on Jesus in baptism, whenever you have participated in his covenant, then you take on a newness of life. You're not the same. You are a new creature in Christ. You have been reborn. You're not the same, and you should not live the same. If you're living the same as you did before you were brought to Christ, before you were saved, before you were baptized, then is Jesus abiding in your house or did he just come for a visit? When Jesus abides with you, it doesn't give us a license to sin. It doesn't give us a license to be a slave to sin. What it does is sets us free from sin to where we don't have to be a slave to it. If, if sin is in your life, you are a slave to it. And so it separates you from your sins so that you can. You, it also, the Holy Ghost endues you with power from on high so that you can be more than an overcomer. So we must change whenever we experience Jesus in order for him to stay in our lives, in order for the Lord to abide with us. We must change because he will not abide. And we are the vessel. We are the temple. He will not abide with sin. Now, if you sin and you come short of the glory of God, you have not lost the Holy Ghost. That, the Holy Ghost is what drives you to the altar <laughs> to say, hey, get this out of here. You've not lost your salvation. Just listen to that spirit that's saying, get this out of here. I can't stand it. I can't live with this. I can't stay in this same vessel with this sin. So clean it out. Clean out your temple. So um, if you're bound in sin, you cannot be righteous. He set me free not to sin. He set me free from sin and shame. I don't want to return to my bondage. I want to abide in him. Because in him is love, grace. In him is light. In him is life. And outside of him is death, is darkness, destruction, oppression. So I want to make sure that Jesus didn't just step into my life for a visit. That he didn't just come to my house and then after he left, nothing changed. I want to make sure that my experience with him changed everything. Hebrews chapter 6. What time is it, brother? All right, it's, it's oily yet. All right, Hebrews chapter 6. And I'm, I'm not too far from done. Verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles, and, and I'm going to explain this to you, of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Okay, now he's not talking about abandoning these things. Okay, don't be confused. Paul writes very uniquely. He said, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from the dead works and of faith toward God of the doctrine of baptisms and the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and, the, and of eternal judgment. And this, we, this will we do if God permit. In other words, we're not abandoning this. Okay, this is, this is our doctrine. All right, but we must grow up. We must move toward in perfection. In other words, we must move into spiritual maturity. All right, we, we can't, you know, if, if I'm having to be, if it has to be sensational, if you have to see somebody stepping out of a wheelchair every Sunday for you to have an experience with God, then you are a, an infant. You're a spiritual infant. You know what? God heals people sometimes, and sometimes he don't. And I don't know why. But I don't understand everything about God. 
But if you want to see sensational, then you need to go to church somewhere else. God does sensational things, don't get me wrong, but this is not a show place. We're not putting on a show here, all right? We have come here for one reason, and the only reason he heals people to begin with is so that it will build our faith. People will believe that they can be saved by him if they are visibly healed by him. But I don't know where I got off on all that, but Hebrews chapter 6. All right, I'm going to begin my reading again. And this we will do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good work of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now those words make my skin crawl. It doesn't mean that if you are a sinner that you cannot repent. It doesn't mean if you backslidden that you cannot come back to God. What this scripture means is that as long as you live an apostate life, an apostate means someone who has turned away from God and to the, they've returned like a dog to their vomit, to their old sins. As long as you're living that way, as long as you've turned away, there's, no, there's no, nothing else. Now you can turn around and come back and that grace and that mercy will cover you all over again. For the earth which drinketh in the rain and cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from God. You know, I talking going back to, I don't want to put the Son of God to shame on my behalf. I don't want I don't want to add to the pain and the shame of the crucifixion on my behalf. I don't want on my behalf for him to be crucified afresh. He will not. He was crucified once and for all. God is not mocked. What we do outside of that mercy what we decide to do how we decide to live if we decide to live outside of that covenant that is on you that's what this scripture is saying but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected can you say rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned but beloved we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation Uh, though we thus speak for God is not unrighteous to forgive your work and labor of love which you have showed toward his name in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister excuse me and so on the other hand Matthew chapter 5 verse 16 Hebrews says here that some who have had the Holy Ghost, okay, whoa, some who have had the Holy Ghost will turn away and they will walk in a way that they seek to crucify Christ afresh in their own flesh and they will, they will attempt to put him to an open shame. Because they have turned away. Now that, I've got goosebumps right now. Just saying those words is frightful to me. Just say, I don't want to live in apostasy. I don't want to live backslidden. I don't want to turn away. Matthew chapter 5, on the other hand, this is where I want to live, right here. Right there. Let's go there. There we are. Let your light, this is where I want to live. This is where I want to live. I want to let that, I have no light within me. Just by myself, there's no light within old Jim Whitley. Okay? The only light that lives within me and the only light that lives within you is of the Holy Ghost. And so, I want to be one of those that has received the Holy Ghost and lets your light 
So shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. As a matter of fact, I'm not, I don't want to live putting the Son of God to shame. I don't want to live my life like that. If I've received that light into my heart, I don't want to walk away. I want it to make a difference. I don't want the Holy Ghost to just come and visit. And because I've got such a, I, I'm a terrible housekeeper. Because I'm such a, I keep such a dirty temple that the Holy Ghost is like, I can't stay. I got to go, Zach. I got to go, Zacchaeus. I can't stay. I want him to abide in the first term, which means to live and not just visit. I want the Lord to live with me and in me. Sin is still a separator. As much as it was ever a separator, it is still a separator. His grace is sufficient. Now, I want you to understand that. You may say, well, Brother Jim, that's awful harsh. It's just the truth. It is just the truth. Sin is still a separator. Now, I want to convince you of something that is the best. It is the gospel. It is the best news that you will hear all day, all week, all month, all year for the rest of your life. This is the best news you have ever heard. The best news you have ever heard is that his grace is sufficient. It doesn't matter what you have done. As long as you are willing to step out of it. It does not matter what you have done. His blood is powerful enough to cleanse you. His grace is sufficient for you. But you cannot abide in your sin and with Christ at the same time. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for what? For what? To unite all of us that had been separated from God to God once again. He who knew no sin became sin so that we could become his righteousness. Matthew chapter 27 Verse 46, Jesus is being crucified. And this is a grim, this is as grim as it gets. The man Christ Jesus who knelt in Gethsemane and prayed, Father, if it be your will to take this cup of sin from me, all of these horrible things that these people have been doing for millennia, And will do in the future for millennia, for the next 2,000 plus years. These people are going to be sinning and doing all kinds of atrocities, horrible things. And I'm about to take this on myself. It wasn't about the nails. It wasn't about the spear. It was about the sin. I'm about to drink all of this down. I'm about to become this. If it be thy will, please take this from me. I don't even know what guilt or shame or sin even feels like. It's a foreign substance to me. I don't even know it, but I I look at it and it's so hideous, but I'm about to become that. And then he said, in about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? The man Christ Jesus, as that Holy Spirit began to depart from him because he had just become sin. Why did, why did the Spirit of God depart from Jesus Christ, the man? Is it because there was sin there? He had taken on the sins of the world and God the Father had to turn his face. From his own begotten son. And why did he have to turn his face from him? So that he could look upon us. Because he could never look on me. He could never look upon me. He could never have mercy on me. He could never call me his son. We could never have a relationship. He could never abide with me. 
He could never come to my house and stay until Jesus died for me and until I participated in that sacrifice. I, uh, if you would stand with me. So where do you live? Does Jesus abide with you? John chapter 15, and I'm gonna gonna read this as my last reading. This is some of my favorite. The book of John is, just stands out as one of my very favorite books in the Bible. He just spells it out so simply. And I guess that's why I like it, I'm pretty simple. John chapter 15, verse 1 says, I am the true vine. You say with me, the true vine? And my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So sometimes when things don't seem like they're going right, you're just getting getting pruned a little bit. God hasn't left you. He hasn't rejected you. You just might be getting pruned a little bit. Happens to all of us so that we can bear more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide where? There's that word again. Abide. And it doesn't just mean come and visit. It means stay hooked into the true vine. You're the branches. I am the true vine. You don't come and abide temporarily. The people that come and abide temporarily, they're thrown into the fire. Those branches dry up and are thrown into the fire. It said, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. You can't bear fruit by yourself. I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth fruit, much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he has cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire. And they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. As the Father had loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. It's an if. He didn't say you're guaranteed to abide in my love. He said if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. These things have I spoken unto you that in my joy, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. It says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye, you are my friends. You are his friends. If you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father have I made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give to you. These things I command ye, that you love one another. Where do you abide? Where do you live? Do you abide in Christ? Do you abide in the true vine? Does he abide in you? Or are you a a, a withering branch? I've been a withering branch. (laughs) I don't know about you. I have done it. I have experienced it. I have been a withering branch. I have been somebody who's 
just coming to church and just getting, you know, just coming to church and next week I just get a little further, scoot over, just get a little further from God the next week. Next week I come back and just get a little further from God and then just before you know it, before you know it, just out the door. So I will ask you the question, where do you live? Jesus is the source of our strength. He's the source of all of our power. He's the source of our liberty. He's the source of our life. He is the source of our grace. He is the source of our salvation. I want to invite Jesus to my house to stay. I don't want to invite him over just for dinner. I want Jesus in my house. I want him in my heart. I want him in this temple to stay. And if that's going to happen, if that's going to happen, you know, if you, if you messed up and uh, chewed at somebody in traffic today, you know what? God will forgive you for that. If you have failed God in some way, it doesn't matter. It can be a big sin. It can be a, what we consider to be a big sin or a little sin. It can be a little white lie. You could have, I don't know. You could have done something really bad. I don't know. Sin is sin. God will forgive you. He will put that under the blood, but you got to be willing to walk away from it. Bring it to the altar. Cut its throat and walk away from it. We cannot live there and still be living with Jesus. Amen. Father, we're so very thankful for your love and your grace. So very thankful for the sacrifice. I thank you, Jesus, for being willing to become sin so that I might become your righteousness. I thank you, Jesus, for reconciling me to the Father for reconciling us to the Father so that we might be called sons and daughters of God. Let me never, let me never cause you or your kingdom shame. Put a strong desire in my heart to keep your commandments, to love one another, to serve your kingdom, and to live in righteousness through your grace and through your mercy. There is nothing that I could ever say that would ever thank you enough, but I want to say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. And um, I hope to see you and your best friends on Sunday. God bless you. See you then.